My name is Tren Lizra, and I'm going to talk to you because it's about reality today about how to connect all the dots and find your life purpose. So before I'm going to introduce myself, we're going to go first of all, and I'm going to show you a couple of things. This is Havana, Cuba today. If you land in Havana, that's what you see. Welcome to Havana, Cuba. It's a... Okay. This is me in Japan studying Zen Buddhism, living in an old traditional dojo. This is me doing computer animation at the top of Canada, working on cartoons for almost a decade. Graduating from business school, speaking in TED in front of 2,500 people. And this is me studying Kabarewa in Cuba. Vamos, más rápido. Tres, A, I. Eso. Ven. Pasaron los años y carros. Eso. Eso. This is it. Eso. <laughs> That's a good sign when you're studying. OK, so you might be wondering, what? <laughs> How do all these dots connect into a life purpose? So my name is Khen Lizer, as I said. I am a social entrepreneur. I'm a seminar leader, and I'm a life coach. I published a, a book that became a bestseller called My Seductive Cuba. It's over there if you want to take a look at it later. And I spoke at TED, a talk that got over 5 million views to date. I'm the creator of this methodology called the three C's of attraction, confidence, charm, and connection with playfulness in the middle. And what I really do is um, I help people find that unique something in them and then connect with it in a powerful way that makes them the best version of themselves. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life journey and how I connected all these dots into a purpose. This is some of the media coverage that I've had over the years in different places in the world. OK, so first stop, I call it daring to follow my heart. The first stop was Japan. I got to Japan because I had two burning questions. One was why there was so much suffering in the world and why suffering was an ending. And that really bothered me. And we'll get to why that was such a burning question later on, because it's something that happened in my life that caused it. So the second question I had, which was burning inside me, was I was debating between leaving this world and living a complete spiritual life and giving up the material world, and studying computer animation. So I went to Japan to look for answers. And I sat in this dojo, and I meditated. And I stayed in a moment, and I was doing every morning and every night meditation. I was doing mindful cooking and mindful cleaning and learning how to be in a moment and, and to really connect with what I was feeling. And after a month, I had an answer. So these are the insights of the first stop. The first one was learning how to give things my undivided attention. Being present is something that you'll see came in very handy, being able to be like right there, connecting. The second one was disconnecting from society's expectation. So there are some people that have no problem and they go after their dreams and they do their stuff, but most of society lives in a straight line and they kind of follow the guidelines and society expects us to behave a certain way. And then when we want to leave society's expectation, we come and we tell people what we want to do. And we say that because we want support. We want people to tell us, you can do it. Most of the time, what you will hear when you come and you ask for support, you'll hear how you shouldn't be doing it and that you could crash and that you could burn and that things could go bad. And what happens is that people tell you what they're afraid that would happen to you or what they're afraid that would happen to them if they tried it. And when that connects with the self-doubt that we have typically when we try something new, because we don't know yet that we should do it, we just want to try it. It becomes lethal, and most people get paralyzed by it. So one of the hardest things is to disconnect from what society expects, the family expects. And because of that, it's hard for us to listen to our heart. Because when there's so much noise, we're afraid to know what we want. Knowing is not the problem. It's the following up on it. But if we know, we have to follow up on it, right? So what happened was that when everything dissolved, I was meditating, and I got really centered and really grounded. And then society faded away, family faded away. And then the answer came, and it was that I couldn't leave the material world because I, I haven't even owned it yet. 
I was running away from even trying, that I had to first win it before I could decide to give it up. So I packed a suitcase and went on my second stop. And the second stop, I call it gaining courage. And this one was, I went to Canada with the help of my family in order to study computer animation because I made a decision. And I got to the top of the animation in the world. I was working in Canada on top projects and across the country and doing computer animation and TV shows. It was fascinating. Living in a kid's world is amazing. You're living inside of cartoons and you're waking up with these characters and you're playing all the time like a kid. Fantastic. But I wasn't happy. And I wasn't happy because I was working 14 hour days, seven days a week. And it was day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and I did it for almost a decade. So no one could tell me I didn't give it a try. And really, I couldn't find any balance. And coming from the balanced zen and all that straight into this was extremely harsh. So I wish I could tell you that I was super brave and that I just went like, ta-da, I'm going to leave and I'm going to do that instead. But it's not that easy. So for five years, I really struggled with it. And I was terrified to leave the comfort zone. I had a great paying job. I had a great career. I had a wonderful future ahead of me. The job was fun itself. Just the lifestyle wasn't good. And I really, I really fought with it. And I, and I struggled. And I tried this and I tried that. And after five years, it's like the battery died. I couldn't do the work anymore. The passion died. And this work is driven by passion. I stood there and I just I couldn't do it. And it's like life told me enough, OK? If you can't listen, I'm going to make you listen. So I basically took a year away from this. And I quit my, my job. And I took a very simple job for a year. And like a 9 to 5 just to pay the bills and all that. And I created a binder. And I still have that binder at home now. And the binder was called Getting the Life You Want. So for a year, my job, beyond just paying the bills, was to search for what I wanted to do. And in that binder, I had different dividers. And I wrote all these things that I thought that I could be interested in. I wanted to be um, a, a photographer in war zones and to, to document what was going on. I wanted to have my own TV show. I wanted to be a best-selling author, to do workshops of my own and lead them around the world. And had all these ideas and stuff. And then for a year, I tried things. I took courses, and I did informational interviews, and I spoke to people, and I really tried to understand whether this one was the right one with the lifestyle this time, not just the job. A year went by, I got amazing information, did amazing things, and I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And I remember talking to my friend Rob. And I said to Rob, Rob is a friend of mine that at the time had a dream job, now he has a better dream job, but he was a wildlife photographer, flying around, taking pictures of animals for the covers of National Geographic and the likes. Dream job by all standards, right? And I said to him, Rob, a year has gone by, and I still don't know what I want to do. Why? And he said to me a sentence that was a, 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 a game changer. He said, you can't find what you want. Because like most people, you don't believe that you can have what you want. I didn't get it. I went with it home. I was like, what the hell does that mean? And I opened the binder. And I looked at all these things. And I was like, OK, I want to be a best-selling author. Uh, I don't, English is not my first language. I don't have a literature degree. Who's going to publish me? Scratch. I want to be on TV, and I want to host my own TV show. Like, uh, no acting experience, never in front of TV, never going to happen. And I scratched them one by one. And that's when I really got it. I was kind of looking at him and looking at me and going like, why am I treating? All these things that I can do, the challenges, as disabilities. I mean, if I didn't have a degree, I could get it. If I don't have experience, I could gain it. Unless I, you know, it was ridiculous to even think that I could do something. But if it was realistic, I could overcome these things. And that's when something changed. Because I looked at him, and I looked at me, and I said, the only difference is that he really believes that he can have what he wants. So he's manifesting that. And I'm the barrier to my own success. Have you heard of fear of success? So I removed the barrier. I removed me. I said, OK, I'm changing my way of thinking. I could have what I want. I'm believing that I can have what I want. Don't know yet what I want, but I know that I can have what I want, which is the first step towards that. So then I locked on. I'm like, dream job. Bullseye right there. I'm not, I'm not stopping till I get there, because I can have it. right? 
So from there, you can imagine where I went next, a Buddhist retreat, a Tibetan one day's time, to clear my mind and hear what the next step was, because I was afraid. I was afraid of what was coming. And I sat in this Tibetan monastery and meditated in silence. It was a complete silent retreat. And I said to myself, whatever the answer will be, I will accept it. I will accept it because it's my truth. I have nothing to be afraid of. So whatever will come, I will accept it. I will accept. And it was like seven days or 10 days of this, of just calming myself down and going, it's okay. I mean, it's my truth. What am I afraid of, right? And it's okay. And then I got this really strong feeling. It was because of all the silence from the, and the grounding from uh, the meditation. And I got this really strong feeling that I had to do business school. And my first reaction was, freaking out. I was like, well, what, do you mean? what do you mean business school? Like, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm, I can't do business school. I'm, I draw and I do this and I do animation. It's like, what do you mean business school? This is like, this is too heady. And the second reaction was, okay, this is my truth. I said, what, I'm going to trust in my truth. What am I afraid of? So I surrendered. I said, okay, I'm surrendering. What's the worst thing that could happen? I'm going to have a degree and nothing's going to come out of it, right? So I surrendered and said, bullseye right there, that's the dream job, business school, sure, I signed up. Now, the second stop's insights. When we are on purpose, we get a lot of vitality. So every time I'm on purpose, people ask me, how come you have so much energy? Because I'm on purpose, because I'm doing what I love, because I'm, an, I'm being of service. The second one is that courage is achieved through small deeds over time. <laughs> we were done. We took the key. <laughs> we can still hear you. <laughs> And just the heel goes like. <laughs> okay. Big breath. Focus. All right. That courage is achieved through small deeds over time. Meaning, I really didn't get up one morning and said, I'm going to go and do this. This is my purpose. I'm going to quit my job and then I'm right here. It, you struggle. You have a hard time. You take something, and the trick is to take something small. And that something small, you set yourself up to win. It's got to be something that you set yourself up to win. Because when you win, your confidence goes higher. If you set yourself up to fail, you're going to go down. You take something, you win. You raise the bar, you win. You raise the bar, you win. And over time, the bar goes higher and higher and in bigger jumps. Till one day, you find yourself on a TED stage in front of 2,500 people. Because courage is achieved through small deeds over time. Oh, wait, before, before we go to the demons. So after six years, I graduated from business school. And I already had um, a successful business, which we're going to get to in a minute. Um, and I got the vision for what it was while I was in school. So the third stop I call the challenges, overcoming the demons. And this chapter is really important because People always, seriously, I hear this a lot. People tell me, well, you're beautiful, you're smart, you're talented. Of course you'll be successful. I can't even tell you how many times I heard that. And no one ever knows. Natalie, you said you're closing the door. <laughs> right. Um, and no one ever tells you, or you know, no one ever thinks about what's behind that story of success or what challenges you had to overcome and whether that was really the case. And there's a big gap between what I went through and what people see on the outside. When I was, and this is why I like showing this one. This is a self-portrait that I drew when I was 20 years old. This is what I saw in the mirror every day. This was my self-image. And the reason it was so bad was because my mom got mentally sick when I was 13 years old. And this was the hardest chapter of them all. And when, because she got sick, I fell apart. Because I grew up with something that was so broken. 
And it wasn't broken because somebody didn't love me. And it was because my mom was a great person with a great heart, but she was very sick. But I saw for 10 years of suicidal thoughts. Ooh. And out of that emotional state, I tried to succeed in life. And this tower of cards kept falling apart inside. On the outside, it looked fine. You're doing this, you're doing that. But things weren't OK. And I was looking for answers. I went on a journey to kind of try and find a way to pick up all the pieces and put them back together. And this is the toughest one. For 10 years, I took just about every course I could take. I went to every specialist that I could. I went to try to really fix what got broken. And this thing kept falling apart constantly. And I remember calling my, a good friend of mine all the time and saying, is it ever going to end? Am I ever going to make it? Is it ever going to stop falling apart for me? Because I was like, I was fighting inside to just be OK. And that's something that we typically grew up with. And that wasn't given. And all through the years, I always trained. I started training when I was seven years old. And I did gymnastics. And throughout my childhood, I think that this is what, kind of what kept me alive, is that I could go at the end of the day and release everything. I could train, I could fly, and, and I, I'd let it all go. And then the next day, I'd meet the same circumstances again, and it would be super tough. But by the end of the day, I would let it go. And all through my childhood, I trained. And as an adult as well, I've always danced about five times a week. So for 10 years, I searched and searched. And the reason why no one knew how to fix this was because all of my base was broken. My ability to trust, my ability to show vulnerability. I couldn't do what I'm doing today. My boundaries were bad. When someone hurts you all the time and it's your parent and they don't mean to, you learn that it's OK to hurt you. And boundaries were something that took me six years to rebuild. Extremely hard. And this is why I'm trying to succeed in life. After 10 years, it eventually came together. And I remember the day when I, I tried to do something, and things would always fall apart. And I was like, you know, when you're looking for the sound, there's no sound. And you're like, hey, I'm OK. I'm OK. I made it. And I swear to god, it was the best feeling ever. Because to date, no matter what I did with Ted, my, my, my book, or what I'm going to do in the future, that felt like my biggest victory. Like I saved me. I could have died. I could have killed myself. I could, many things could have happened, but I saved me. So I was extremely happy about it. But the second feeling that came right after was like, OK. What do you mean OK? That's not good enough. After this kind of a journey, OK? I'm going to live an OK life? I don't want OK. I want ex extraordinary. I want spectacular. I want amazing. Something that would be worth this journey that I had to go through. So I kept going. And that's when I arrived in Cuba. I was in business school at the time. And I arrived in Cuba, and I, it was about, I was about to launch my first business, my Cuban Dance Academy. It's not surprising that it had to do something with the body, because for so many years, it helped me. And when I came to Cuba, Something was constantly calling me back, to come back and to study more. And at first, I thought it was about the dance. But looking back, what it was, was that inside of the movements when, you dan when I'm dancing and everything that has to do, there was a thing called the sabrosura. And first of all, there was, in that elegance, was self-worth and pride and confidence. And inside of the sabrosura, that magical thing that the movement of what we move, there is physical self-love. So in order to do that, Cubans say, amo mi mano, I love my hand, my arm, pero es para ti. Yes? And to learn how to, to release the sabrosura, which is, by the way, in all of us, men and women alike in every culture, you have to get to a state of disfrutar. Disfrutar means self-enjoyment. So to be able to create that, I have to first love every part of myself without judgment. And second, to learn how to enjoy myself. So even when you walk, you have to take pleasure in every movement and anything that moves. So I found a human treasure of what makes us feel 
amazing. And I know how to push the button on and off and how to give it to people. Quite a treasure. So I went from this to this. That's the new image. And that's what I see now in, thank you. <laughs> that's what I see now in the mirror when I look. So third stop insights. If you want extraordinary, aim at extraordinary. If you aim at ordinary, you'll find ordinary. It's what we manifest. I could have stopped at okay. I was okay, right? But I found amazing. That's way better. Willpower. Never give up and live, leave yourself. Success is the only option. People ask me all the time, Han, how do you do these things that you do? I go like, well, 10 years. I had to keep going and I didn't know if I would ever make it. 10 years till it came together. How many of you give up after one month? I have to give up after three months, six months, one year. How many of you can stick with something that's hard to achieve for 10 years till you'll get there? How many of you will stick with it till it happens at all costs? Willpower. If success is the only option you leave yourself, you'll find a way. Because what happens is that you meet it and it doesn't work, so you come from here, so you come from here, so you come from here and eventually you find a door. When something doesn't succeed, you go like, oh, I give up. You never find a door to make it happen. Willpower. Fourth stop and final stop, connecting all the dots. So in 2005, I launched my Cuban Dance Academy in Canada, and I had it for about 10 years, and I was very successful. I had hundreds of students. I was in the media nonstop. In 2008, I launched the tours to Cuba, which is why you see me in the middle of Havana taking pictures and videos of, of the city. And I've been leading these boutique little tours with people coming from all over the world since then. And I get to spend four months a year in Cuba. Was that worth the journey? <laughs> yes, absolutely. In 2011, I released my book, My Seductive Cuba, and turned it into, I self-published, I turned it into a bestseller, and I flew to New York to receive an IPP, uh, IPPY book award, which was quite phenomenal. Then I was ready to raise the bar up again. And the next one was like I said, I want to do TED. <laughs> and everybody told me, Han, you're insane. How are you going to get into TED? There are 14 people that get accepted a year. I'm like, it's done. Nine months later, I was on that TED stage and I delivered a really powerful talk that got over five million views to date in front of 2,500 people. And the night before I went on that stage, I remember sitting in my bed and I, I asked myself, I said, Ken, why are you doing this? Why are you on stage in front of 2,500 people. Why are you challenging yourself in such ways constantly, you're putting yourself, you're gonna have to be bigger than the sum of 2,500 people tomorrow, why? Why do you need to do this? What do you need to prove to yourself? And I sat in my bed and I thought, it's my way of forgiving the world. The world is not such a kind place anymore. And if there's one thing that I've learned from this journey is that most people that you meet will judge you and criticize you and make you feel small when you're going through a hard time. Very few people, once in a while, you meet that good soul, someone that's got light in them, and they give you energy and they support you and say, you can do it, but we don't have enough of it. <coughs> Doing this kind of work, for me, allows me to forgive the world because I can make it a better world to live in. And it's something that's worth then the whole journey. So for three years, I've been connecting all the dots of this journey. So the Zen that I've studied allows me to be really fully present and to create situations where people get really present and to work in seminars and in coaching and bring something really unique. I bring people, I calm them down, I bring them back to the moment. Natalie, I'm going to kick you up. <laughs> <laughs> There's signs on the door. Right. <laughs> Business school has taught me how to take ideas from start to end and to make them happen. How many people do you know that are super creative, they've got great ideas, but they never make them happen? 
They talk about them, but they don't find a way to make it a reality. I can bring it down to strategy and to marketing plans and to business plans and to numbers. The numbers tell you whether that's going to succeed or not. And the market research tells you whether there's an opportunity in the market, whether there's a gap and where you can tap into it. The body work that I've done, I've worked with so many people over the years that when I work in seminars and one-on-one, -on -one, I can tell what goes on inside of people from the way they move. That comes Andy, right? <laughs> and I can shift what goes on with them somatically through the body because I know what goes on and I see the process, the internal process that reflects on the outside. Animation has taught me about playfulness, about being in a kid's world, about playing. And when you're teaching people what I'm teaching, you want to help them tap into that place. God, I do really well with kids. We speak the same language, right? And we need that playfulness in order to bring that out. And finally, my mom's illness taught me empathy. Because having to live next to a manic depressive person and understanding that she didn't ever mean to hurt me, it was just her illness, forced me to kind of stand from her side and look at life. And that comes incredibly handy now when I'm coaching people and I'm doing seminars because I can understand where they're at and it can come with empathy, empathy and compassion and I can help them see the way out and not get sucked into their, into their stories. So in reality, the journey of our life is a big palette of colors. And we get to paint whatever painting, whatever masterpiece we, can, we want to do with it. It's up to us. The, the three C's of attraction extended, which is the circle that I teach, is basically something that runs inside us. In circles and it's universal I've tried it in Turkey and I tried it in New York and different places in the world and it works what I did was just observe um, it's on the site by the way you can look at it on my site um, I basically just extracted it out from all of us and what I do is I restore that flow and when that flows when that flow flows naturally again there's something that we exude that attracts to us what we want Right? Do we like people that are confident, we want to be around them, people that are charming, people that are really present, people that really connect? Do they attract us? Yes. yes, right? So this work is that I do now is the accumulation of, of now they're coming from here? <laughs> is the, the, the work that I do <laughs> is the accumulation of two decades of work in, you know, with playfulness, with body work, business skills, with um, coaching, with everything is the accumulation. This is what it means to connect all the dots. And what I do today is really lead tours, seminars, and one-on-one -on -one coaching that teach people uh, my special methodology. So what I'm really doing my job is to give them that treasure that I found so they could find that as well. So, fourth stop, insight. We can turn any curse into a gift if we choose to see the gifts that they offer us. We could see it as a catastrophe, but we could also see it as amazing. So, to conclude, it's not easy to follow your heart and to to live your purpose. If it was easy, then everyone would do it, right? But life was not meant to be lived just to pay the bills. Disney, I don't know if you know this, but in the early 20s, he went bankrupt. And J.K. Rowling, she got rejected over and over and over and over and over again till one publisher said to her at the end, yes, and turned, and turned her into a billionaire best-selling author. What they all did was keep going in the face of failure. Your failures can become a path to greatness if you choose to see the gifts that they offer you. We all have a gift inside us that wants to come out. The question is, will you have the courage to believe that you can have it and determination to follow through till you will get it? When you pick a cause that's greater than oneself, it has a momentum of its own and a life energy that inspires you and others. 
And that's where, with creativity, you can find a way to connect the life dots into a life purpose. And that's where you get to leave a legacy behind and a footprint. So my message to you today is, make this life count, because it's the only one you've got. That's it. Thank you.